Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this talk on data sharing. Uh, my name is Sarah Hart and I'm at the Florida State University in the Department of Psychology as well as the Florida Center for Reading Research. There's some contact information if you would like to reach out to me. You know, I'm on Twitter probably more than I should be. Uh, my email and my lab website um, as well as you might be interested uh, to check out if you're interested in topics related to meta science and development and the methods of uh, developmental science, you might be interested to check out the podcast that I have with my colleague and friend, Jessica Logan called The Fin In Between. <clears throat> okay, so a little bit about what today is so that if you've popped into this uh, session and this doesn't, I'm gonna give you a second to hear what I'm planning to do so that you can leave if it does not fit into what you're interested in because there's some other parallel sessions happening. Uh, this is an introduction to data sharing. So talking about some of um, you know, the, the, the topics within data sharing, you know, defining some concepts, giving a few resources uh, and tips of how to do some data sharing, uh, but it really is meant to be fairly introductory. So if you're familiar with data sharing, if you've done it before, um, you might find some of the other more in-depth sessions, uh, kind of where you wanna go and engage that way, uh, or else you can hang out with me. I don't have very many slides, because uh, the plan really is hopefully a lot of question and answer uh, and talking about data sharing hesitations if you have them or kind of other experiences you've had with data sharing. So a lot of my talk uh, today is based on a paper that I published uh, with my colleagues Jessica Logan and Chris Schatzneider uh, and you can check that out in the ERA open uh, as well as some experience that I've gained in building um, a data repository for our field it's called LD Base. Uh, and it, uh, LD Base has uh, been built to, 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 uh, to, to store and share data uh, from educational scientists uh, like you all on the call. Okay, so a little bit about what data sharing is. Uh, so data sharing, I kind of, if we take a, a, maybe a formal definition of what data sharing is, it's the process of taking any type of research data and making it available for other researchers to examine or use uh, and I added on this last bit, you know, you can share your data anywhere, really, and you could, you know, you could share it on your private internet or really anywhere to the open internet. But typically, data sharing is thought to occur through an established data repository so that it's easier uh, to find for other users. So something that I like to point out when I talk about data sharing is that uh, if you've never, you know, some of you on the call may think, well, I've never done data sharing before. Uh, but if you've published, you have been doing a form of data sharing. Um, simple statistics in your publications like mean scores or correlation tables uh, are a, a form of data uh, and uh, you have been sharing your data through your publications. And the way you can kind of think about that is, you know, meta analysts go collect data in the, in the literature by collecting the information that you have shared, the data you have shared in your tables of your publication. So pretty much everybody in education has been doing a form of data sharing uh, uh, with at the very least kind of descriptives and simple uh, statistics in your publications. Generally though, we tend to think when we're thinking about data sharing, we think of it as a sharing kind of participant or variable level data. So a little bit more detail than those simple statistics. Um, but why I mentioned that simple statistics is in the end, if you're not able to uh, share your full participant or variable level data sets, you know, sharing a variance covariance matrix is still useful for the field, still usable for other users uh, and still can be counted as data sharing. Okay, a little bit, there's a, a really interesting example from developmental science about data share that has um, participated in data, data sharing for years. I think since the early 80s, I think they used to send around kind of floppy drives of the data uh, called, um, it's now more often I think called TalkBank, uh, but you may also know it as child or child as, I actually don't know which way it's pronounced. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is a, um, a data repository of uh, uh, language corpora. Uh, and so it's uh, like text from different language narrative conversation or, or conversations or other sort of language samples um, that are shared in this data repository. And it has hundreds of these language samples uh, and those language samples have been used um, to uh, in thousands of peer reviewed papers. Uh, and at any given time, I think I saw a statistic that something like 
at least 100 users are on the data repository on a given day. Uh, and they have over 4,000 kind of active enrolled users uh, who are signed up to use um, this uh, data repository. Uh, so this, you know, the, the child's data repository has been incredibly uh, uh, useful uh, for the field of, kind of language development and understanding and linguistics. And I think serves as a great example of just the, the power and the benefit of data sharing. Uh, and um, what I'm motivated to, to do is to uh, kind of expand, you know, what was, you know, this example from Child's, the Child's Data Repository and expand that, you know, and think about all the data that's around there in our field and how we can uh, share it uh, and expand the power uh, uh, of those data. Okay, so uh, I, I started to let on kind of this next slide of what is the benefit of data sharing? Uh, there's so many benefits. Um, one benefit is uh, generating new ideas. Uh, so when you share your data, uh, the idea behind sharing data is to allow others to use your data. And, you know, if you've ever, uh, you know, really had a scientific conversation with anybody else, <laughs> you, you know, and you're kind of, you know, you know, spitballing back and forth ideas, research ideas. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you're like, that's a really great idea. I just never would have thought about that. You know, every person in our field has a different approach, a different background, a different way of thinking about research questions when they approach their science. And that includes when they would approach a data set. And so when you open a data set for others to use, you know, often uh, others use it to come up with research questions and to explore scientific questions that are you know, completely different than you ever would have thought of as somebody who generated that data set. Uh, so sharing data is a great way to generate, generate new scientific ideas uh, and um, yeah, and support our field. Related to generating new ideas, uh, uh, data sharing is also great kind of more broadly for advancing the field. You know, we can then push the scientific boundaries of our field by kind of allowing other brains to, you know, come up with research questions within data or to, um, uh, you know, to, to really kind of maximize the potential from our data that's been collected. Because as you know, in our field, our data is extremely time intensive and typically expensive to collect. And so by, you know, allowing others to use your data and, and advancing kind of the, the science of our field by using and reusing data to gener through generating new ideas, uh, we can really, you know, push, push the boundaries of where our science is as a field. I kind of, you know, taking a slight turn away from those two, the first two uh, benefits of sharing data. Um, sharing data also can increase the transparency of the research process. Uh, so uh, if you share your data and then hopefully share it with, you know, accompanying data documentation, as well as, you know, maybe a code that you've generated to use that data to, let's say, write up a paper using those data. Uh, you know, you allow others, including potentially like trainees, uh, you know, and, and classes who are learning a new statistical procedure and they use your code and your data to understand um, how you do that statistical analysis, all the way to allowing people to, you know, check uh, the results of your published work or any of your, your scientific um, products. Uh, and, and uh, you know, make sure that, you know, there, if everyone knows it's pretty easy to make coding mistakes, you know, you can have somebody kind of come behind you and make sure that there haven't been any uh, mistakes uh, in your, um, in your analysis or kind of otherwise. So, you know, uh, sharing your data openly kind of, you know, in general increases our, our feelings and our, uh, and our, our thoughts about transparency of, of the research of our field. Uh, sharing data also can increase collaboration. I'm definitely experiencing this, experiencing this firsthand right now. Uh, you know, when you put out a data set that you've collected in a way that people can find, you know, those people who are finding it reach out to you. Uh, and either, you know, they might just simply ask for questions, but they might actually ask, you know, do you want to collaborate on this paper? Uh, I would love to use your data to answer this research question. You know, they're generating new ideas. And, uh, and so, um, you know, they might want to, again, uh, uh, co-author a, a publication using your data if, if they choose. Data sharing does not require that, but uh, it just naturally lends itself to this increasing collaboration, as well as, you know, hey, 
I saw your data, you know, you're the expert in this area of these data, you know, is there a way we can put in a grant as colleagues to, uh, you know, further maximize the potential of that data through a new research idea through a grant. Um, so sharing your data uh, tends to uh, result in increasing collaboration. Uh, another area I'm really compelled in with sharing data is promoting equity in research. You know, um, not every investigator in our field can, you know, has an IES grant or has large, you know, Research One University startup resources to be able to go and collect the pilot data that they might want for a grant. And uh, by sharing your data, you can allow other users to use that data, not only to write publications, uh, that might help support their career, you know, for their dissertation or for their tenure and promotion process or whatever it is, because they don't have the resources to be able to collect that sort of, you know, the data that you were able to collect. But also, um, you know, not only publications, but, you know, uh, data that's shared in repositories can be used for um, pilot data for grant proposals. Uh, and just this morning, I woke up to an email um, from somebody who reached out to me to say that they, uh, you know, had used uh, the data in the in LD base, the data repository um, that I mentioned earlier to write, to use it as pilot data to write a grant and they received the grant and now they're off doing their own research, uh, but they didn't have access or the resources to be able to collect that data to, 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 to serve as a preliminary data in their grant proposal. So, uh, you know, we can democratize access to high quality data through data sharing. And then finally, a little bit less um, hopeful of a reason to share your data is uh, often funders require it these days, especially federal funders. I'm, I'm most familiar with the US funding ecosystem, uh, but it's definitely the case I know in European funders and other areas where, uh, you know, if, if the public taxpayers are paying to collect those data, then those data are part of the public and should be shared back to the public. Uh, and more and more funding uh, mandates are coming out to require um, at least a plan, a data management plan for how you're going to share your data, uh, as well as uh, sometimes also having like kind of teeth behind those requirements and checking to make sure you have openly shared your data. Okay, so those are some reasons why we may wanna share data. I see a couple of chats, so I'm gonna take a second. Um, and see if there's any questions. Okay, I think everyone, thank you for your comments and for starting uh, uh, conversations in the chat. I love it. So please continue to do that. Uh, and we're gonna have lots of time at the end of my talk to you to do that. Okay, so uh, I gave you a definition of data sharing. I gave you some reasons why you should share your data. Uh, and now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how you might do that. Uh, so data sharing does not equal being a data dump. So you may have heard before what are they called, um, you know, thinking about data sharing within uh, the, like a fair uh, um, way, that's not, it's not way, I'm forgetting the word, but under fair principles, that's the word I was looking for, uh, sharing your data with fair principles, with fair standing for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'm gonna talk about each one of those, not in depth, but a little bit so that, and with examples of what that might look like to our field when we're sharing data. So first is findable. So findable, I mean, you can kind of gather what, what I mean when I say that your, your data should be findable. You know, other users should be able to locate and find the data that you're sharing. So that's why like sharing data on a more private server is not, doesn't quite fit the fair principles, but sharing your data to a public data repository that's, you know, uh, searchable, uh, you know, via Google uh, or is, is, is findable from the open internet is, is kind of um, the, the best example of how to share your data. Also part of findable is uh, not only is it findable, but that it's, um, that sorry, to help make your data findable, you need metadata. So the reason why search engines like Google work well is that they, uh, you know, they, oh, I, do, I think they do like text mining now, but they mine uh, websites or other places or mine data repositories for metadata. So for information describing the data that's held within that data repository. And so you as a user, if you're up, you know, sharing your data in a data repository, uh, you wanna uh, 
to fill out, to uh, provide good metadata, good general information about your data so that people can find your data, can not only find it on the internet, so like go to a data repository like LDBase, and they're like, okay, I think your data is probably stored here, but then within LDBase, they can search for, let's say I'm interested in data related to math development and childhood. Uh, and the only way that that works well is if there's good metadata. So information about the project, that your data was part of, uh, information about, let's say, the principal investigators of the data, the study design, participant info, variable info, code books. This is all kind of under this umbrella of metadata. And, you know, as important as data sharing is, so like literally taking your data set and sharing it on a data in a data repository, more important is actually the metadata that you supply around that data set so that people can find your data and use it. Um, uh, in for it for what they need. Okay, let's see. So somebody, um, uh, yeah, okay, we're gonna come back to the funding requirements for the, the money in a little bit, I think. Um, and then open data sharing. Uh, so data sharing, right, is again, you know, providing participant or variable level data and at best, or even just, you know, summary data statistics in a way that others can find it openly uh, from the internet. Uh, so a user can, you know, can, can get access to that data without having to send you an email uh, necessarily to ask for, from, you know, can you share that data set with me and then they email it to you, kind of the old way of doing, you know, contact the authors um, for access to that data. Okay, uh, so that's findable. Remember we're talking about FAIR principles right now. Uh, Let's go on to A. Oh, I'm sorry, I lied. Here's some more information about the code book and, the, and more metadata. Um, again, talking about kind of how important the documentation or the metadata is around your data sets. Uh, here's some example of good, um, you know, a way that you can uh, create a code book, uh, you know, that represents the data that you're sharing. Uh, so, you know, a good code book will include uh, names of the variables in the data set, uh, the labels for those variables, the either the specific question or item uh, that that variable represents, and the coding system, the, the values, and then the labels for each of those values for each variable. This is the level of detail uh, that you can that you should create with your metadata to support the findability of your data. Okay, now onto the A, accessible. Uh, so accessible uh, means uh, uh, accessible from the internet. So at the very least, to, if your data and your data sharing falls under the FAIR principles, your data should um, be accessible from the internet. Now, I say that, and I also have the point that your data itself does not have to be totally open to the data, to the internet. There may be lots of reasons why you don't want to share your data. You might be concerned um, with identifiability within your data, or there's other, you know, concerns in your data set uh, that means that you don't want the actual data set to be openly available from the for any user from the internet. But to fall under the fair principles, the metadata for that data, so uh, potentially the code books or at least project descriptors, uh, should be openly available from the internet. And one easy way to do that is to use a data repository. So uh, many data repositories give you the option, you could have um, you know, your data set itself uh, and all of the accompanying metadata it can be openly available to the internet, or you can have just the metadata openly available and accessible, um, but the data set itself is only available through request or if you have, you know, you have to show that you have IRB permission to access that data or whatever it is. So this is the accessible uh, um, principle of the FAIR principles. Uh, some examples of data repositories uh, for our field. Um, there are, there are uh, certain levels of data repositories. The first level is called general data repositories. So they uh, are created to store pretty much anybody's data. Uh, they're not field specific. Um, so they're these, you know, kind of domain general data repositories. An example is OSF. Um, also Figshare uh, is an example of a, a general data repository. Uh, the ICPSR, um, which is now normally more often how it's called, but it actually stands for Inter-University Consortium of Political and Social Research. Uh, that is also a domain general repository. They um, do take in and house data from educational scientists. 
uh, as well as Dataverse. Um, so one example of Dataverse is uh, the link that I gave you here to Harvard, but there are different uh, instances of Dataverse kind of um, available uh, and are um, you know, accessible for, for storing data uh, from across domains. And a, a different than a domain general repositories or discipline specific repositories. Uh, so these are repositories made for a specific community of people. Uh, and so they're, um, they are created with that community in mind and then therefore kind of optimized for that community. Uh, and so some examples are Databrary within our field. So Databrary stores developmental video data. So they are specialized in not only a developmental data, but also in video data. And so it was created purposely to be able to store videos. Similarly, there's the a qualitative data repository. So this is a data repository to store not video data this time, but qualitative data uh, uh, from the kind of the broad social sciences. And then another example is LDBase. That's the data repository um, that I'm involved in. Uh, and uh, LD standing for not just learning disabilities, but actually standing for learning and development data, as in kind of everybody on this call's data, we, we specialize in storing, in storing uh, not uh, in quantitative data from developmental and educational sciences. There's also grant repository, sorry, uh, a rep data repositories that may be specific to funders. Uh, so NIH is a, a prime example of this. They have created data repositories to store data of their grantees. Uh, Dash is one example. Uh, this is the data repository created to store the data from um, NICHD grantees, which many of you may be familiar with that institute at NIH if you're educational scientists. Uh, as well as if you do autism research, um, there is the uh, NDAR data repository. So that's the stored data from autism researchers. So there's many different places, uh, different uh, data uh, repositories that are available to you that have been built to store your data from you know, domain general repositories to uh, more specific repositories uh, that may be more optimized exactly for the type of data that you have and that you want to share or data that you want to access as a data user. Okay. So the I now of the FAIR principles uh, is interoperable uh, and uh, this is a, a more of a computer term uh, than a researcher term. Uh, this is this idea that uh, your data, your metadata, and then the accompanying documentation of your data sets are readable to other computers. So that may sound like a really specific kind of like IT term that you don't have to think much about, but I'll give you a kind of a prime example of um, proprietary uh, statistical software. So if you've ever tried to open, uh, you know, say like an SPSS data sets in a different software, uh, you have run into issues of proprietary software formats where it can be really difficult to open up data sets that are saved in proprietary formats in other softwares. Uh, you know, I've always joked that if you're an R user, well, pretty much any, actually any software, that kind of the hardest part of any, any software is bringing in the initial bringing in of your data set, right? Kind of getting those, uh, getting the format correct and making sure that your computer is reading that format correctly, that it's reading the variable names correctly and the variable labels. Uh, and so this is this idea of interoperable uh, that um, you know, your computer can open that data set, recognize what the values are, what the labels are, what the variable names are, and properly, and even missing data values and properly read that. So that's the interoperable um, principle of fair data sharing. And then the R is reusable. So uh, th this idea is that, uh, that you know, it's kind of like the idea of, you know, if you build it, they will come. If you put out your data set for sharing, then you would hope other people will use it, right? So you want to have users be able to find your data set and actually reuse the data set. So once again, we had metadata in the findable uh, principle, but here we have it again in the reusable principle, right? If you've ever gotten somebody else's data, uh, you will know how hard it is to reuse some data sets without good metadata. You know, you need good data documentation and good uh, 
project level information or kind of all the aspects of the data set that when, if you are not the person who created that data, uh, then you just don't know, you know, all of, all of the, you know, those specific things that happen in a data set without good data, metadata. So by having good metadata, you make your data reusable by other users. Uh, and uh, another uh, aspect of reusable, a little bit different than the metadata piece is um, provenance. Uh, so, you know, you want other users to use your data, but you also want to tell them how they can use your data. Uh, and uh, so you can choose different licenses and a good data repository will have different license options for you to choose so that you can decide how you want your data to be reused. Um, you know, everything from, uh, you know, uh, let me know that you're reusing it to, I don't need to be involved at all, go forth and write your publications and your grants with these data. Uh, also part of that is, um, uh, DOIs for citability. So a data repository uh, should uh, hopefully give you a, a DOI for your data that makes your data set then um, citable, uh, which you know is a key kind of currency to our field. Uh, you know to to cite products that we're using, so that the, the creators of those products, including data sets, can follow who's using their work and um, uh, and also kind of track it maybe for you know, their original grant tracking or whatever it is. So uh, part of this reusable function is assigning in the uh, DOIs. And then as a data user, using those DOIs as part of a citation of using those data sets. Okay, so I've convinced you uh, about why you should wanna share your data and uh, in some aspects about what makes data, of, uh, data sharing kind of fall within the FAIR principles. Um, and now I'm moving you all into being ready to share your data. Okay, so some, some things to think about uh, before you start uh, uh, sharing your data. Uh, you know, well, even sharing your data is pretty far along. So let's take a step back in your, in your uh, research process and think about before your study starts. So uh, informed consents and considering informed consents can be an important part of sharing your data. Um, if you are, you know, going out and collecting new data. So you are, you are uh, the data creator uh, through you know, interacting with participants. Uh, and so you're writing an informed consent that your participants are gonna fill out. You know, consider the language that you're including in your informed consents. Uh, I, I know how the research process works. You, know, you don't necessarily rewrite an informed consent for every new project. You copy over language from your previous informed consents. Uh, and maybe even your previous informed consents, maybe you got those from, you know, back in the day in your advisor's lab, and those were the informed consents that were used in your advisor's lab. And, you know, these informed consent language have been recycled over and over again. And, you know, back in the day, uh, informed consents used to have to have pretty restrictive language around data sharing. Uh, and so what I would recommend to you is to just take a second and look at your uh, informed consent language and not use restrictive language in your informed consents. Uh, it's not needed by IRBs or ethic boards anymore. Uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, let your participants know that you plan to share your data. You're going to share it in a de-identified way, uh, and uh, you know, kind of, you know, um, don't say things like "I will destroy all data in seven years," uh, which is a holdover from kind of a previous year and thinking about data. So think about the language you're including your informed consents if you're collecting new data. Let's say you're using archival data. So you are, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, a project that you completed 10 years ago, and now you're like, hey, I know data sharing is important. I know I can really increase the value of these data by sharing it so that others can use it because it's just sitting on my computer and nobody is using it right now. Uh, I encourage you then before you share your data to, to check your informed consents for maybe that old restrictive language. Uh, and don't fret if you do see an old informed consent of data you would like to share. If you do see um, a, a language that is restrictive, um, the IRBs now know that there is a culture around data sharing. That data that um, funders are, you know, more and more requiring sharing of data, uh, even older data sets, and so they are open to what's called um, considering a waiver of consent. Uh, whereas you write your IRB, even the IRB you're at now, and say, I have this old 
data set and these old informed consents that had this old data, you know, I will not share data, I will destroy all data language. Uh, and I would like to waive that original consent. I can't recontact participants, um, but all I would like to do is share this data in a de-identified way for others to use these data sets. And in my experience, I've been very successful in receiving these in waiver of consents, given kind of the change in, in, our, in our research culture around data sharing and understanding kind of the importance of data sharing, and then also understanding that um, de-identified data is a very low risk to participants. If you'd like to know a little bit more about what informed consent language you might consider and how you write protocols to IRBs for waivers of consent uh, and otherwise, uh, we have a resource page on ldbase.org where you can check out some resources where we have templates and other um, language to kind of help you navigate informed consents. Okay, also before your uh, study starts, you're going to think about your data entry. So if you're collecting new data, uh, I would encourage you to take the time uh, to have your data entry process enter item level data and not just, you know, if you let's say in, in my, my sub area of education, you know, we love the Woodcock Johnson test. So, you know, you study reading and math ability and kids using the Woodcock Johnson battery, uh, but you may not, you know, take the time to enter in how did that child perform on item one and item two and item three of the letter word ID test, but instead you just enter in the total score uh, and move forward. Um, a lot of really great um, data reuse ability comes from storing, from using item level data or having access to item level data. That is, uh, you know, one of the most common requests we get on LB base is looking for data sets that have item level data. So I encourage you to consider entering item level data. I also uh, encourage you to use consistent variable naming approaches, you know, within a project and even across projects in your lab, uh, so that it's, um, you know variable names are kind of part of the metadata of your data set and it makes data reuse easier uh, if you have a consistent variable name approach. And then also uh, please use double data entry that um, results in good high quality data that you then can give to others to use. Uh, and there's a citation of some work that's been done that's looked at data entry errors across different data entry uh, procedures and really kind of shows that the value of, of spending the time to do double, full double data entry. Uh, also, if you're interested in data management more broadly, there's a lightning talk I recommend that you go see later. Uh, and I've also listed some resources towards data management and good data management practices uh, that you might be interested in. Okay, so after your data is collected, you're gonna clean your data. Uh, you know, you're going to uh, make sure that the missingness that is in your data is expected, uh, that it wasn't a data entry mistake, but instead it's an expected missingness in your data. You're going to check for out of range values uh, and you're going to check for inconsistency of values. So things like, you know, a date stored as a character value rather than a numeric value and the like. So this is kind of cleaning your data again, kind of thinking about, okay, what type of data as a data user would I want? And I would want, you know, high quality data that, um, uh, and so uh, if I'm collecting new data and I, you know, I want to make sure I clean my data before I share that data uh, in a data repository. So see, these are some things you can think about when cleaning your data. You're also, as part of that data cleaning process, you're going to de-identify your data. Uh, you know, uh, a specific date of birth uh, can be identifiable, uh, but, you know, uh, age is important in, develop in developmental or educational work. And so you can turn that date of birth into an age, which is less identifiable, uh, you know, removing names and other direct identifiers, things like zip codes or addresses, you know, remove those from your data. Sometimes you need to think further than just direct identifiers though. Sometimes you need to think about indirect identifiers, especially what's often called a cross tabs identification. So let's say, you know, everybody knows, you know, I'm at Florida State, maybe my data collection is probably obviously from the surrounding Tallahassee area or, you know, Florida Panhandle. Uh, and, uh, you know, in that set of schools, you know, it's a fairly limited set of schools I have in my data set let's say, uh, you know, a, 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 a male teacher who identifies as African-American. And, you know, that it, once you do that cross tabs across three variables, uh, you know, or two variables, a gender and race, it actually can make a participant uh, identifiable within that data set, whereas just gender or just race would not be identifiable. So this is this idea 
of looking across these indirect identifiers and combination of variables to see if you can get to a cell that has only one participant in it and that participant might be identifiable. We've created some resources to help you check your de-identification, including an, an app, a shiny app that will, that will go through your data and, and identify any areas where you may have identifiable data in your data set. So I encourage you to check out uh, some resources that we have on LD base um, to kind of help you with that data de-identification. Okay, also throughout your study, you're going to want to document your study. We've talked, I've talked about how uh, metadata is so important uh, and that metadata, it, it can be pretty frustrating and time consuming if you create all the metadata at the very end of your study. So I do recommend that you take the time throughout your study to just take a moment and write down um, the information that you're going to need for your metadata later. So, you know, summary information about your study, sample information, protocols, uh, the measures that you use in your study, um, missingness and how you're coding missingness in your data, as well as a data dictionary um, are all a kind of a key aspects of documenting your study that will then create the metadata when you share your data in a data repository. Uh, that can be incredibly frustrating to have to create at the end of a project or if you're like me and can barely remember what happened last week, never mind what happened on a, pro a, 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 you know, a protocol decision you made three years ago during active data collection, it will be impossible to recreate at the end of your study. So throughout your study, document your study uh, with an eye towards what metadata you'll need in your sharing of your data. And then at the end, uh, you know, you're gonna pick a data repository. I suggest you all pick ldbase.org, but I gave you a list of all kinds of different data repositories you may consider. They all have different pros and cons uh, and different kind of uh, ways that they can optimize to be the right place for you to share your data. Uh, and you upload your clean de-identified data. Okay, um, this is a, a question that we get. I saw earlier in the chat uh, that this question already came up, this idea of resources. Sharing data uh, is not, uh, it, it is not cheap in regards to money or in time. Uh, and it's a common that I hear about, you know, uh, it, well, it just does take uh, resources to properly share your data. Um, so some places that you may consider to find uh, resources, you might check your institution uh, to see if they have small grants with, that are within the institution or other kind of pots of money to help you. Um, to share your data or to do the, the data management that you need for your project. Um, even maybe something like, you know, a, a funded graduate research line so that a graduate student can help kind of oversee, you know, good data management practices in your lab uh, or, uh, you know, to create the data documentation so that you can share it. Uh, you should also consider uh, if you're a grant writer investigator, um, at least here in the US, uh, writing in data management and data sharing budget items are allowable expenses. Uh, and uh, I encourage you to put those expenses onto your budgets uh, so that you have the funds that, um, to, uh, to get the expertise to do, to do everything that you need to do to share your, your final data. Librarians are also an amazing resource at universities. Uh, you know, I, 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 we have a librarian as a co-investigator on our grant for LD Base, and they're uh, part of our tech staff and creating our data repository. You know, librarians specialize in storing information. And if you, data is just another type of information. And so librarians, when they go to, uh, to library school are trained uh, in uh, data management uh, and uh, can be really great resources within your university to help support your data sharing. Um, uh, you know, questions or potentially resources as well. Uh, and uh, uh, there are some funding sources out there. If you're a US-based investigator, the NIH has a grant mechanism that you can submit. Uh, it's $100,000 in direct costs um, for I think up to two years uh, to support your data sharing. The grant is entirely just to give you the money needed to, um, to get your data sets where they need to be to share them in a data repository. So you can check out that grant mechanism or uh, there are probably others that I'm not familiar with that is specifically to support investigators to get archival data sets shared. And then you also might uh, look, like I said, to your libraries to see if they have uh, mechanisms 
for funding. Okay, that's the end of my formal talk. I see there's been lots of chatting and questions and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see those better. Uh, I would love to hear questions. I would love to hear about hesitations or other concerns that you have. I keep a list of those uh, and so that I can you know, better inform future presentations like these uh, and then think about how we can support our community towards data sharing, what, however that looks for our community. Uh, so um, there's my contact information. Uh, and yes, that's the end of my talk. So I'm going to turn off, uh, turn this off and turn to questions and, and chat. Okay, well, I actually just see the video of myself, <laughs> but I see there's question and answer. Uh, so I'll, I'll go to the, the chat. Um, Let's see here. Um, navigating, it's hard not to be able to see or talk to anybody. Uh, okay, so I answered the question of what is open data sharing, I believe. Um, can you make a clear difference between open data and sharing data? Um, I, you know, I don't actually think that I like firmly have a clear difference. I think I just, when I'm speaking in, so this might've been me being a little unclear, I um, kind of use those terms interchangeably. Uh, I prefer data sharing, because I think that more directly refers to what, what it is, you know, sharing your data, however, um, you know, ho however you share your data, as, even if it's just the metadata. Um, but, um, uh, I would at least say open data is kind of similar, but some may define open data as um, the data that's not only shared, but op like shared freely to the internet. So there is no request process to use that data. Uh, but I'd, I don't really demarc the two terms the same way, but others may fight me on those, the differences in the terms of open data to sh data sharing. Um, Yeah, so is there a requirement procedure for how or whether to write data sharing into an IRB a consent? Um, you know, full, full consent, full knowledge uh, is ideal and your IRB would love you to explicitly say in your informed consent uh, that, um, you know, you plan to share the data and that would include to, uh, you know, researchers outside of your team. Uh, and we have some example language that, like that on the resource section of, IR, of LD base. But in reality, my experience of working with at least American based IRBs is you can share your data even if you don't explicitly say that. You just run into problems if you've explicitly said you will not share your data. So, not saying that you're not going to share, that you're not saying you're going to share the data does not preclude you from being able to share your data. Uh, although, open and free consent, you know, uh, uh, kind of ethical guidelines would say you should tell your participants that's your plan, uh, but it is not a requirement to actually share your data in my experience. The issue is if you've explicitly said, I will not be sharing that nobody, the common language or thing or, or words like um, only the research team will access these data or data will be destroyed after seven years or five years is a common one I've seen. Uh, and that can get a little confusing because if you I think what we used to think when we said that was that the paper data will be destroyed, but in reality, now our data is electronic. And so that would suggest that all of your access to your data should be destroyed after seven years. So um, don't write anything like that into your, into your informed consents. Uh, yeah, Crystal asked if I could see the chat. I can, there's just been a lot and it's hard to scroll. So I'm sticking to the question and answer here for now, um, but I can maybe move over to the chat after I, um, go through this last one. So I've heard concerns from researchers who put the tremendous time and resources. Yes, this is definitely a concern that I hear often uh, about getting scooped on mining their own data sets for publication. Yeah, so I have a couple of answers to that. Um, first, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I like to show the positives of data sharing and, and to support researchers in any way towards data sharing. Uh, and that includes very hesitant or skeptical researchers. I like to support uh, everybody into data sharing. And so I support people from where they are. So if a researcher is 
you know, very hesitant and they're worried about being scooped. Um, I talk to people about the idea of, you know, maybe your data sharing is the data that un that's underlying a paper. So you've already, once you've published a paper from a specific data set, then, then you share the data to that publication. So you've already published the research question that you intended to from that data. When I'm writing new grants with people and I'm working on creating data management plans with them, I also can uh, suggest ways to, um, that you might, um, you know, in your data management plan, you might say that you will share your data after, you know, the three main papers of your three specific aims or whatever it is are published. So once the major uh, specific research questions for that grant are published, then all the data sets, the data from that grant will be fully public, fully made open so that you get the chance to write the key. Let's say if you're doing like an RCT, you know, the, the original investigator is going to want to to publish the, you know, the impacts paper from that RCT. And so you write into, you can write into your data management plan. This is, this is still data sharing that you will share your data after the impacts paper is written uh, and published. So uh, that that's my way of trying to, you know, again, we're still getting to the final goal of sharing the data with our community in the end, but the timeline does not have to be as soon as the data, that piece of data is collected, it's shared. It can be on, you know, a, a more elongated timeline to get you to publish. I've also written into a projects of, you know, scooping might be a biggest concern for, you know, early career researchers. Uh, and so I say, I've said things in data management plans like, we will, um, you know, uh, until, you know, three early career researchers have written papers or whatever on these data, then we will share that data to give the early career researchers on the team the chance to publish first before then sharing the data. Uh, and, um, and then also generally what I usually talk about with people when we're talking about concerns about scooping is, at least my experience in our field, and this may be you know, specific to my sub area of our field, I just, it is so rare for somebody to come up with the same research questions that I came up, that I come up with, uh, and that I had planned for a data set. Uh, you know, I, at least in my, again, in my subdomain in education and developmental science, um, there, the, there's just not a lot of overlap of the type of research questions that everybody is kind of hunting around that exact framing of that research question. And so I'm, I, I, I'm a little bit less concerned about scooping that exact research question because what I have most more often have seen is that people from different backgrounds and different trainings and different approaches come at a data set from a completely different, you know, or at least a different enough approach um, that still make, you know, publication possible for everybody using those data. So those are some ways that I think about concerns and talk with people when they have concerns about scooping um, on using data sets. I would love to hear if other people have other ideas. Again, I'm always, I have a pen and paper with me. I would love to write down thoughts on how we can communicate and support people where they are uh, and show them that there are di many different ways to get to data sharing. And it does not have to be your entire collected data set out as soon as it's complete, as soon as you've collected it. And um, there can be kind of other, other, other ways to, sh to share data, if, even for those who are hesitant around aspects like data scooping. The larger change in a sentence structures of the field, um, I, th my research area is definitely not like examining re incentive structures. Um, I, I'm toying around with the idea of doing, um, trying out different, uh, like doing an experiment to see what incentives we can provide investigators to share their data. One of the ways that I got into data sharing actually um, a years ago was I entered in the, uh, the Center for Open Science had a competition where you would get cash if you did a pre-registration. Uh, and I, I did that, I did that competition and I published my, uh, my first um, open science related paper using that and incentive of cash. Uh, and I've considered doing something like that through LD base and, and trying out different, experimentally trying out different incentives that might get people to share their data. Um, but in the meanwhile, before that, I've where I've seen big changes from top-down incentives. So 
the funders mostly kind of forcing change uh, that really worked well for open access publications. You know, if you're an NIH, uh, I, you know, I get NIH funding and, you know, before every progress report, every year of my NIH grant, when I say we've written these papers on this grant, those papers have to be openly available or else I can't get my next year's worth of funding. You know, kind of that top down uh, linking your next year's of funding or, or future grants to creating open access publications has worked in open access uh, publications, I think. And I, I hope that the kind of the new data sharing requirements that are coming down the, uh, the pipe from uh, NIH and IES. Uh, IES has had it for a while, but you know that they will have a little bit more kind of teeth to them uh, in, in requiring um, what investigators are saying in their data management plans. And the next question is, there are so many great data sets out there that have become accessible to investigators. Yeah, the struggle is finding, yeah, Yeah, so that's why I've been compelled this idea that question. Everybody can see the questions, I hope. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, the hope is um, that why I like domain specific repositories like LD Base and why I'm encouraging everybody to use LD Base is that, uh, that it is easier for the community to know where to go to find data. You know, if data sets are existing some on some personal websites, some are out on, say, ICPSR, some are out on, you know, COS, some are out, you know, on all these different places, and the community doesn't know where to go to find data. And that's what's nice about a domain-specific repository instead, where, like, if I need, you know, if I'm looking for behavioral data in education and developmental science, I will go to LD Base because that's where the investigators who work in that field are storing their data, and that's where I can find it. In addition, you know, that finding data is such an important part, right? It's the, the F of F FAIR principles um, that, uh, you know, uh, we've created, for example, I, I was talking about LDBs because that's where I have my most, you know, specific uh, knowledge from, but we created, you know, the metadata fields uh, in LDBs to be completely optimized to our field so that when you're searching for data, when a new user is searching for data, they will use the type of terms that we have already created the search terms around. You know, that's, um, you know, so that it, it, you know, that searching and finding data is easy because it is specifically made for you as a user to find that same type of data. Uh, and so it makes it easier to find the data. So I would suggest, you know, being thoughtful about what data repository you put your data in, because where are users going to go to try to find your data? Um, and then that will kind of make it easier if we start to maybe coalesce around kind of communities around data. Yes, do I think it's important to teach students about data sharing and open data? I do. Um, I actually taught a graduate level uh, uh, professional development class last semester, and uh, five, four weeks of that class was actually not traditional data, uh, you know, professional development topics, but instead was about uh, open access principle, uh, sorry, uh, open science principles, as well as good data management practices. Because um, good data management kind of lends itself then to sharing uh, data. And uh, so I do think it's really important. I don't think there has been Oh, there's not a lot of explicit um, training in that. Uh, in that, uh, the lightning talk I told you all to go see later this afternoon at three, um, uh, they will be discussing uh, uh, some recent research of survey data that looked to see exactly like where have people learned about data sharing and good data management practices. Uh, and it has not really been uh, explicit formal training in graduate school or the like. And we're hoping, Jess Logan and I are hoping to, to get a grant funded. We've been putting in grants to create training workshops around um, data sharing and data management practices uh, to help support our community because um, otherwise it really isn't typically trained at the graduate school level. Okay, those are the qu formal questions. So I'll just glance through the chat here. Oh, somebody has been putting the questions in the chat. Thank you.
sorry everybody about not I, I just see now that you weren't able to see the questions but I see that um, they've been posting the questions over there so you could see the full text but then read them fully out loud because I thought you all could read them let's see Oh, someone put a great resource in there for a cost infographic for data sharing. Um, that's a great resource. Oh, and for budgeting data management. Great. Oh, good. Some resources from the qualitative data repository. Yeah, I'm I'm a, a quant researcher, so I mostly think about quantitative data, but it looks like somebody's been sharing some um, some qualitative data uh, data sharing uh, resources. So thank you for that. Somebody asked about uh, um, libraries that have a formal um, data sharing funds. Uh, you know, I said that in, in a hopeful way, but I actually don't know of any explicit examples. I know at FSU, the librarians um, are available for expertise in that area uh, and actually will spend some of their time helping investigators do data management and data sharing. So not a fund that you can apply for necessarily, but what I've seen is that they are, uh, they, the, the resources that they give is their time and their work on helping you do that. Um, so that's something that happens at FSU uh, and that that may be more how the librarians could support you with their time and their expertise um, in, in helping you set up your data management and data sharing. Uh, but yeah, if anybody has any example of actual funds available internally, that would be great. And maybe we suggest there may be some librarians here today, I bet, uh, you know, I've seen funds on supporting open access publishing uh, and also open textbooks, and it would be great maybe for funds to be available through libraries for investigators to, um, to share data sets that they have or prepare to share data sets. Somebody asked if LDBase um, includes a direct observational data. Um, yes, anything that is a, a you know, a a quantitative data point uh, can be shared in LD base and may be available there. So I encourage you to go and you can search for it. Um, uh, off the top of my head of the projects and I'm super familiar with LD base, I'm not sure if we have any data sets that have uh, direct observation like researcher observation, I'm assuming um, uh, with self-report, uh, but there are a lot of really big uh, RCTs especially in reading interventions that are in that data set. And it would not shock me if there were some, um, maybe classroom observations or teacher observations in those data sets. And I scroll back down to the new ones because we have like a minute left. Oh, great. Yeah, somebody's talking about some funds for open access uh, textbooks. Librarians are amazing, y'all, and you should work with your librarians at your university. There's a whole, breed of research librarians that are here to support your um, research. Um, uh, and that includes your data sharing. Yes, librarians for the win. Okay, well, I think we're just about to run out of time. And so I'll kind of wrap it up, but I, I th this may stay open for a little bit. So I'm happy to just watch the chat uh, just in case anybody wants to continue to chat with me uh, or move into maybe an open data so I can actually see you and hear from you and <laughs> not me talking to the wall. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone uh, for coming to the talk today. And again, I'm always happy to talk about data sharing, talk about if, um, you know, if you have data management uh, plans that you're writing for grants. If you're writing IES grants next summer, I'm happy to talk to you about how the LD base might um, support you uh, in your data sharing goals. Oh, great. Lots of great resources. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think in general, the consensus is this was a really informative, interesting, wonderful talk. And thank we're excited. you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.